Is oral terinable a Deanabol without the side effects? A budget anivar? Something in between or something entirely different? Chlorodehydromethyl testosterone is the only anabolic androgenic steroid in existence specifically designed for athletes, and it's solely responsible for many world records and gold medals at the Olympics. So now that I got your attention, let's find out if Turinabol still holds up to this day. Vigorous Steve here. Almost the entirety of the available scientific evidence surrounding chlorodehydromethyl testosterone, better known as oral turinabol, is about drug metabolism or bowel transformation or the detection of urinary metabolites for the sake of failing athletes for doping. There are a good amount of older studies available in German language only, and I couldn't find those full publications anywhere. So this video will be short, very short, to be exact. As always, I looked for the medical insert of Genifarm Oral Trinable, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And funnily enough, it's very easy to find product packaging of Genifarm Oral Trinable all over the internet. And every time you look at those pictures, there's no indication that there's a leaflet or a booklet or some sort of paper that indicates the description of oral turinabol or the clinical pharmacology, the indications, the contraindications, warnings, precautions, etc. Plenty of pictures, no medical inserts to be found, which doesn't surprise me because oral turinabol was administered to athletes unknowingly disguised as vitamin pills, when in reality it's clearly an anabolic androgenic steroid. If you do happen to have access to the medical insert of oral turinabol, please let me know, email it over, I don't care if it's in German language, I'll get it translated, I would love to make a follow-up video and discuss the contents. So if there's no clinical application, because there's no medical insert, and again, oral turinabol was never FDA approved for medical treatments, it was only administered to athletes. So what about the athletic application of oral turinabol? East German athletes under state plan research theme 14.25 were administered between five milligrams up to 35 milligrams oral turinabol daily, sometimes a couple days in succession, sometimes for a couple weeks, sometimes in combination with other performance enhancing drugs, but many of the time they were administered oral turinabol unknowingly. And there's one publication which documents all of this, performed by Frank et al, published on July 1977, titled Hormonal Doping and Androgenization of Athletes, a Secret Program of the German Democratic Republic Government. In this study, they analyzed several classified documents, which were saved after the collapse of the German Democratic Republic in 1990. And the authors go over Research Program 08, later renamed to State Plan Research Theme 14.25. And they also go over most of the human data surrounding the administration of oral turinabol to athletes from 1966 to 1974 as part of a government-sponsored doping plan to win medals at the Olympics or other world championships. This publication is a very interesting read, but let's stick to the dosing protocols and the safety data which was recorded during the time that these adults and adolescent athletes received oral turinabol between 5 milligrams to 35 milligrams daily, sometimes in combination with injectable 10 milligrams to 50 milligrams testosterone propionate weekly or 100 milligrams testosterone enotate plus 1500 IUs HEG weekly, as well as mestanolone, nandrolone decanoate, growth hormone, and even amphetamines and methamphetamines. Female competitors winning medals and breaking records during the Olympics or the World's or European Championships took anywhere between 1185 milligrams to 3680 milligrams oral turinabol yearly. At the highest dose of 35 milligrams oral turinabol daily, that might mean that these female competitors took turinabol between 33 to 105 days out of the year, or far, far longer if they took it at a lower dosage. Unfortunately, we don't really know the exact protocols, even though a good amount of the protocols are exactly described in this publication. Most of the commonly reported side effects amongst the male and female athletes were muscle tightness, body weight increase, virilization, gynecomastia, and libido changes, an increase in libido or severe reduction in libido. And it's unclear if these side effects are based on oral turinable only or with co-administration of other steroids and human chorionic gonadotropin. And regarding the muscle tightness, this might be something you're after as a bodybuilder or strength athlete because your muscles look denser and harder and fuller, but it might also increase your strength. But as an endurance athlete, muscle tightness will hinder your endurance. 
And to go back to the cramping, we might be able to explain this with a little bit of scientific evidence later on, and also knowing that the studies of dorsanolone mastrone or methanolone primobolin saw a significant increase in muscle cramping in the human studies, um, there might be a little bit of overlap regarding the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, but we'll discuss this at length later on in this video. And this part of the publication is actually quite sad. When athletes requested to stop their vitamin pills due to intolerable side effects, the coaches and the prescribing physicians actually force these athletes to continue with their supplements. And due to these terrible side effects, some of the athletes requested to be withdrawn from elite competition. So even though oral terrinable caused many a gold medal and world record to be broken, it also ended the career of many elite athletes in Germany. And what's even more sad is this case report, performed by Fruner et al, published on October 15th, 1990, titled Intertesticular Lyomyocarcinoma in a Young Man After High Dose Doping with Oral Turinable. This study describes a young German man who took up to 100 mg oral turinable daily at various stages of competition preparation for five years between the age of 18 to 24 years old, far too young to dabble with PEDs. This was alongside testosterone injections while he was weightlifting for the German Democratic Republic, participating in international championships. He developed gynecomastia during his competitive career, probably due to the testosterone administrations. Maybe at that time, there were no aromatized inhibitors available or selective estrogen receptor modulators, or the knowledge simply wasn't there. And he developed an intertesticular lyomyocarcinoma nine years later. This is far after discontinuing the turinable and the testosterone. His testicle was surgically removed as part of an orchiectomy. This sounds very, very troubling. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this young German man at that time knowingly took oral turinable as part of vitamin pills or uh, labeled as oral turinable. But of course, if you start injecting testosterone, then it's pretty clear what's going on. You know what? Suddenly I feel like playing Wolfenstein 3D multiplayer over serial cable. Who's with me? But I'm playing William BJ Blazkowicz. You guys can be the Genifarm lobbyists or the GDR coaches or prescribing physicians. Joking aside though, let's go over the unique characteristics which are evidence-based surrounding chlorodehydromethyl testosterone. It increases athletic performance. Turinable is the only gold medal achieving and world record breaking anabolic androgenic steroid out there. It increases fibrinolytic capacity in humans and animal models which improves platelet adhesion and wound healing. And this is stemming from the only other available human study performed on oral turinable, besides the GDR state plan doping documents, which we just discussed. In this study, they took 20 patients with fibrinolysis insufficiency. They received between 5 mg to 10 mg oral turinable daily for up to four months, after which their condition improved. And apparently, chlorodehydromethyl testosterone, or some of its metabolites, inhibit cytochrome P450 enzymes, some of which are found in the mitochondria. That's CYP3A7, cholesterol sidechain cleavage enzyme, CYP11A1, steroid 11-beta-hydroxylase, CYP11B1, aldosterone synthase, CYP11B2, aromatase, CYP19A1, and cholesterol 24 hydroxylase CYP 46 A1, all stemming from in vitro studies. So this means that turinable or some of its metabolites lower aldosterone approximately 12%, cortisol and corticosterone approximately 49%, estradiol undetermined percentage, pregnenolone 42%, um, and it reduces cholesterol metabolism 42%, and dihydrotestosterone, progesterone, and testosterone metabolism as well. It reduces cholesterol removal from the brain and reduces drug metabolism. So this is very important to understand that chlorodehydromethyl testosterone or some of its metabolites have steroidogenesis inhibiting effects. And some of its metabolites activate the mineralocorticoid receptor, which might increase blood pressure, also stemming from the same in vitro study. So the inhibition of aldosterone synthase lowers aldosterone levels by about 12%. The metabolites might activate the mineralocorticoid receptors with about 30% the affinity of aldosterone itself. Cortisol and corticosterone reduce by about 50%. So I would say that the net outcome regarding mineral corticoid receptor activation is severely diminished after adding in the oral turinable 
to your stack. And we can somewhat confirm this based on the cramping reported by the athletes in the old GDR state plan doping documents. It appears that you're still at a net loss of sodium and perhaps other electrolytes. Now, don't get me wrong, oral turinabol can still potentiate a good amount of blood pressure increase, but that's not found in the scientific evidence anywhere, again, based on two human studies, uh, but it's only mentioned anecdotally. So keep this in mind, oral turinabol might still require you to put blood pressure management in place. And this is very interesting because we know that aromatase inhibition lowers estradiol levels, which indirectly modulates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and helps to regulate blood pressure that way. But does this mean that aldosterone synthase inhibition by chlorodehydromethyltestosterone, drostanolone, methenolone, or perhaps other anabolic androgenic steroids are direct, albeit mild, renin angiotensin aldosterone system modulators as well? Right? A lot of scientific evidence still needs to be performed in this context. This scientific publication is reasonably new. Again, all citations are down below in case you want to read it yourself. But I think I'm starting to see some more overlap between these particular compounds. But besides these beneficial effects for blood pressure, there are also two animal models which show a negative effect on heart health. Chlorodehydromethyltestosterone might impair cardiac microvascular adaptation to exercise, um, the compound increases cardiac myocytes, so it's the cells of the heart muscle, and it reduces myocardial oxygen supply during exercise. And it also worsens myocardial function, again, animal models, left ventricular hypertrophy and systemic oxidative stress. So there might be a net negative outcome regarding your heart health. Many of the other anabolic androgenic steroids have not been investigated in this context. We do know that anabolic androgenic steroids in general can cause left ventricular hypertrophy, but also issues regarding oxidative stress that's well documented in the scientific literature. But if it also impairs microvascular adaptation during exercise, reducing oxygen supply to the heart, you would expect impaired endurance, impaired stamina, impaired performance, which isn't what we see in real world practical application of oral turinable. Again, it won many world records and many gold medals and most of the users of Turinabol report that endurance, stamina, and performance increases. So how much of these two studies do we need to take to heart or with a grain of salt? I'll leave it up to your judgment citations down below. I couldn't find any clinical trials performed on oral Turinabol, nothing on liver tox, no high-dose studies, no HPTA studies, no exercise studies, besides the GDR state doping plan documents no safety and efficacy studies. I'm just going to throw this out there. At this point, Osterine, a selective androgen receptor modulator, has more human studies, more clinical trials behind it for us to analyze the safety and efficacy data and make an informed decision with. But Osterine didn't win any gold medals, or did it? With oral Turinabol, basically all we have is a good amount of anecdotal experiences from the enhanced fitness community. People either love or dislike Turinabol. Some people say that it's a deanabol without the side effects, no bloat, no gynecomastia, no lower back pumps, or it's a budget version, a cheaper version of oxandrolone that you can easily run at double the dosage of the effective dose of oxandrolone to get similar effects, which might still be a little bit more expensive. But hey, if you can't find legitimate oxandrolone, then Turinabol might be a close second option. And some people also report that Turinabol increases their endurance similarly to how boldenone increases endurance. So basically, Turinabol is always compared to or second best to other steroids. Users of oral Turinabol report similar changes on blood work parameters at effective dosages for anabolism and performance compared to other oral steroids. So you can expect your lipids to skew, SHBG to drop, liver enzymes, creatinine, creatine phosphokinase or lactose dehydrogenase or other training related markers to increase all of which can be mitigated with ancillaries or over-the-counter supplements, assuming you keep the dosages moderate. So let's proceed into the evidence-based detection times, shall we? The half-life of chlorodehydromethyltestosterone following intravenous administrations is 16 hours. I couldn't find the half-life of oral administrations anywhere. So we're going to go with the IV administration half-life going forward. After 5 mg chlorodehydromethyltestosterone administered orally, the detection time is up to 45 days. But other studies show that 40 mg chlorodehydromethyl 
testosterone administered orally was detectable for 22 days with an estimated detection time between 40 to 50 days. There's a transdermal administration of 10 mg chlorodehydromethyl testosterone being detectable for 14 days. And after 500 mg was administered orally to horses, it was detectable for only three days. And based on other urinary metabolite excretion studies performed on horses, it seems that horses metabolize these kinds of drugs significantly faster compared to humans. So if the detection time is 45 days following a single administration of only five milligrams chlorodehydromethyl testosterone, then um, we should stick with the reported detection time of 12 months. Yes, 12 months. This is almost as long as nandrolone decanoate of 18 months. So if you're subject to drug testing in and out of competition, I would recommend you to not use oral terinabol and stick with oxandrolone, which again is far superior with a far lower detection time of approximately 21 days instead. And it finally brings us to the dosing protocols for chlorodehydromethyl testosterone. I would recommend as a sustainable and tolerable dose anywhere between 10 milligrams to 30 milligrams daily, either split morning and evening on rest days or taking the full dose pre-workout, preferably sublingually, until blood work parameters become unmanageable. That could be six weeks, it could be eight weeks, could be 12 weeks, could be longer. Again, there's no real safety data on chlorodehydromethyl testosterone besides that single study, which is, uh, well, already decades old. So um, you're going to have to go with your blood work. And regarding the deleterious dose, I would say anywhere between 30 milligrams up to 100 milligrams daily. Again, some guys prefer to run oral terinable at 100 milligrams daily, either the full dose pre-workout or split AM and PM on rest days until blood work parameters become unmanageable for a maximum of six weeks continuously. Now, I do know guys that run oral terinable up to 50 milligrams daily for weeks on end, longer than six weeks for sure. And they know how to manage their blood work parameters. They love terinable. They love the endurance boost that they get out of that. They absolutely swear by oral terinable because it was designed for athletes after all. Um, but they do their blood work. That is key, right? They deploy the ancillaries and the over-the-counter supplements. So if you want to increase the dose into the deleterious dose ranges, blood work, blood work, blood work, ancillaries, over-the-counter supplements to keep yourself healthy, please. And for women, before we get into the sustainable and tolerable dose, please, please do yourself a favor. First, read that state plan uh, doping documents publication, which I highlighted at the start of this video, before you consider running 2.5 milligrams to 5 milligrams oral terinable daily, because libido changes, especially heightened libido, even at low dosages of five milligrams or 10 milligrams daily, is already reported. And menstrual irregularities and other virilizing side effects are also reported at lower dosages. So please read that study first. I still think that oxandrolone is superior, but if you only have access to oral terinabol, then well, start low and build your way up as needed, right? Either the full dose pre-workout or split AM and PM on rest days until blood work parameters become unmanageable. But at these low dosages, you probably see minimal effects on blood work parameters. And I would say for women, the deleterious dose is over five milligrams daily. So that's between five milligrams to 20 milligrams daily, same dosing protocols uh, for a maximum of six weeks, preferably shorter. But again, if you're going to do competitions, especially performance or endurance competitions, then maybe a longer period of time is warranted. Again, and it has been designed for athletes and there's a good amount of scientific literature that you can review in that state plan documents publication. Um, until blood work parameters become unmanageable, obviously. But honestly, for women, I still prefer oxandrolone because there's a lot more safety data to make decisions with, especially around virilization and other side effects you should pay attention to if you're a woman. And otherwise, you can convince yourself by reading the citations down below, the state plan doping documents publication, I'm sure you'll come to the same conclusions. Okay, let's leave it here. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section, as well as the citations. They're all in the comment section, right? Do additional research if you're interested. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve. Vigorous crew, you guys know what to do. A front double bicep for you guys. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next Best Dose of Steroid XYZ video.